Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're just going to take a couple of minutes to allow um, our attendees to come into the session. Um, we hope you're having a nice day so far. We are recording the session, so if you have to step away for any point, um, you'll uh, definitely have the information available to you after today. So we'll run through a quick introduction in just a sec, and then we're going to just dive into talking about UNE's uh, PA program and how to apply. So Jess, do you want to go to the next slide and we can quickly introduce ourselves? Um, my name is Elise Murphy. I'm the Assistant Director of Recruitment for UNE's Westbrook College of Health Professions. Work with a number of our graduate programs within our Westbrook College of Health Professions, one being our Physician Assistant Program. Um, so I'm excited to be chatting with, uh, with you today, but I want to allow my colleague, who's going to be the major, uh, who's going to spend the majority of the time sharing um, some information with you, allow her to introduce herself. So, Jess, you want to say hello? Yeah, I'm Jess. I'm the admissions coordinator for the Physician Assistant Program. Excellent. So, um, if you go to the next slide, Jess, here's just a look at today's format. We are going to um, be talking about the current open cycle, so the cycle 23-24, um, and this is just a caveat that we like to share before diving into any of this information. If you are planning on applying in future cycles, use this as a baseline, as a nice foundation to understand our general requirements, but know that requirements could change from cycle to cycle, so um, keep that on your radar, and um, you're always welcome to touch base with us ahead of applying for whatever cycle you choose to, um, just to make sure that um, you're aware of all of the admissions requirements and if there are any changes. But we are going to be reviewing our current admissions requirements. Jess is going to be offering some recommendations and suggestions, and then we will open up the session to Q&A. We've uh, set an hour for this event. If we don't need this, the full hour, you know, we may end the um, event early. But uh, if you do have any follow-up questions or things that come up after leaving today's session that you want to connect about, please feel free to reach out. So Jess, I think um, I'm going to hand it over to you to walk through some important information. Yeah, of course. So the most important dates for this application cycle are the opening date and the application deadline. This year it opened on April 28th and the verified deadline is October 2nd. The verified deadline means that we must have received your application that has been verified already by CASPA by October 2nd. So we do recommend submitting probably a couple weeks early if you can to ensure CASPA will have time to verify your application before we receive it. We require a minimum overall and BCP GPA of 3.0. Both GPAs are calculated by CASPA. We do not do the calculations ourselves. BCP includes all biology, chemistry, and physics coursework. Once you have met the minimum overall and BCP GPA, we do often take the last 60 credit hour GPA into consideration as well, but it cannot replace your overall or BCP GPA. We have several prerequisites for our program, including anatomy and physiology one and two, and both must be completed with labs. These are the only prerequisites that do have a time expiration. They have to have been completed within seven years of matriculation. So for this coming cycle where you would be matriculating in 2024, we require that they be taken in 2017 or later. We also require biology one and two and chemistry one and two with labs microbiology with lab, biochemistry, two semesters of behavioral science, two semesters of English, and one semester of statistics. Please consider that all prerequisite courses must be successfully completed with a grade of C or better. And if you have coursework that is still planned or in progress, it should be listed on your application as planned or in progress. Courses that are planned or in progress at the time of application submission should be completed no later than December 31st, 2023. We will not be able to consider your application if you're planned to complete your prerequisite courses after that date. 
We do have recommended coursework, including pathophysiology, advanced physiology, genetics, immunology, cell biology, and organic chemistry with lab. We do consider all of these courses when reviewing your application. So it does work in your favor if you've completed any of this coursework. It is important to note that if you're going to be applying in a future cycle, starting next year, genetics will also be a required prerequisite course. Please submit all of your transcripts directly to CASPA, not to our Office of Admissions. We do need every transcript, even if you only took one course, even if it was only an online program. We need transcripts for every course you've taken. We also require three letters of evaluation. At least one letter must come from a healthcare provider, and we're defining that as an allopathic or osteopathic physician, a physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner. The other two letters should come from other healthcare providers, professors, supervisors, coworkers, really anyone who can testify to your professionalism and ability to work as a physician assistant. Um, we cannot accept letters from friends or family members. Some areas that the letters should highlight on are adaptability, conflict resolution, empathy, intellectual ability, interpersonal relations, oral and written communication, reliability, self-awareness, and team skills. These are all attributes that our admissions committee prioritize in an applicant and will make you a competitive ap applicant if these can be outlined in your letter of recommendation. We do require a minimum of 500 hours of direct patient care experience and 20 hours of patient physician assistant shadowing. This must be completed prior to application submission. After application submission, you can continue completing more hours and updating your application, but you must have met the minimum by the time you submit your application. Shadowing hours must be completed with a licensed PA. We recommend shadowing in more than one practice facility and practice area, such as different specialties or different uh, geographic places. Um, we do accept virtual shadowing at this time due to COVID complications. And shadowing hours do not count towards your direct patient care experience hours. Shadowing hours must be direct unpaid observation hours. We will ask a few for a few personal statements. The first one, the personal statement, why are you interested in being a physician assistant? We also require a short essay of why you have decided to apply to UNE specifically and a COVID-19 impact essay on how COVID-19 has impacted your pathway to becoming a physician assistant so far. After submitting, um, you are responsible for keeping track of the progress of your application. CASPA will not reach out if you're missing an item or if verification was not completed. If you're in any way unsure of your verification status, you should contact our admissions office and we can reach out to you regarding your application status. Completed applications are when all required materials have been submitted to us. It's important that you take survey of your requirements and necessary materials prior to submission, as your minimums must have been met by the time we receive your application. Once your application is complete and we have received it, you will receive an email notification from our admissions office. All right, this is where I, um... I step in. Um, I just want to share some upcoming opportunities for you to connect with our PA program, whether it be on campus or virtually. Um, this past summer, um, actually last week and a few weeks before that, we have hosted two virtual open houses with our PA program faculty and a couple of current students. Those recordings are available and we're happy to share those with you. But looking into the fall, we will have opportunities um, both virtually and for you to come um, visit us on campus. In the next couple of weeks, we have um, some campus tours that will be student-led, as well as we're really excited to share an on-campus open house on Saturday, September 16th, which will be um, a nice lively event to get to know our program, our um, students, and see UNE's facilities. So we welcome and invite you to attend that event. There will also be a November open house, just in case if you can't make the September one. But this link here, grad.une.edu, is actually um, um, 
you all have a personalized UNE page. So registering for today's event, you have a, a personalized URL that's been created. This is where we have a lot of our event registrations. If you don't have access to that, it has been shared maybe in a couple of emails. I would recommend bookmarking it, but you can um, navigate to grad.une.edu. It's a, a form that um, as soon as you put in your email, the system will recognize you and bring you to your personalized page. So this is where we'll have all of our upcoming event dates, as well as more information around these sessions. So we would love to have you join us on campus this fall or connect with us remotely. So um, wanted to just throw that out there for you guys. And I think just the next slide um, is just some contact information. So um, you're welcome to follow UNE's PA program on Instagram, a nice sort of inside look into the program and the day-to-day. -day. Um, and here's our contact information for the Office of Graduate Admissions, our general email, as well as Jess's direct contact information. So we're happy to um, answer any questions that you have today in this session, but you can always connect with us after um, for follow-up and throughout the um, admission cycle. Anything else, Jess, that you want to share regarding staying in touch? Nope. Uh, you can feel free at any time to reach out to me via email or phone, and I'd be happy to help you with any questions you have in the application process. Excellent. All right, and I um, so we're going to actually stop sharing our presentation. And um, as a reminder, we are recording the session. So if you're just logging in, don't worry. We just ran through some quick information, some baseline information about um, applying to UNE's PA program, but we want to use um, this next time period to answer any questions. So you can always go back and review some of that. But I think Jess will reiterate a lot of what you shared um, in this conversation that we're gonna have now. So um, let me just pull up my Q&A or my list of questions. And we do have the Q&A function available for you. So um, please feel free to drop your questions in there and then we'll answer them live. So, um, Jess, I want to start with uh, the admissions deadline because we're coming up soon. Um, and I think it's really important to reiterate um, um, that we are, you know, our, our final admissions deadline is October 2nd. But can you again clarify what verified means and maybe recommend when students why students really shouldn't wait till October 2nd to submit their application? Yes, so every application that goes through CASPA must undergo a verification process where CASPA verifies uh, who you are and your transcripts and things like that. And sometimes, depending on how busy they are, that process can take up to a couple weeks. So when we say that October 2nd is the verified deadline, CASPA must have received your application, verified it, and sent it along to us by October 2nd, which mm -hmm. means that applicants should probably try to submit their application a couple weeks at least before October 2nd to ensure that CASPA will have enough time to verify their application. So right now we're in mid-August, as just shared, mm -hmm. you know, it could take anywhere from a couple of weeks to the turnaround could be a bit quicker than that too. But we do suggest that you start, if you are considering applying to UNE's program and to the PA, uh, um, to this cycle, start to kind of wrap up um, your application and getting it submitted. Um, and if there are any other questions regarding the um, admissions deadline or anything about verification, please feel free to drop it in the chat, but I think that's a really important point that we want to make sure it's just very clear to people. So Jess, um, I think, why don't we dive into some categories and then if uh, people have questions related to what we're discussing, please feel free to drop it in the, the Q&A. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that this event um, satisfies your needs on your end, but um, talking a little bit about coursework in the presentation you shared, the required coursework, but um, where can students take prerequisite coursework and do we accept online coursework to fulfill pr prerequisites? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do accept online coursework. Um, we accept 
prerequisite courses from any accredited U.S. institution that includes online programs, community colleges, and anywhere else that is regionally accredited within the United States. Um, we do require that a transcript can be provided showing that your course meets the recommended credit hours and showing what final grade you received in the course. So that is something to check on, especially if you're taking with an online program, ensure that you'll be able to get the documentation showing that your course met the requirements. And um, we shared it in the presentation, um, but I will also drop our admissions link in the chat. Um, it had um, the list of courses, the number of credits required, um, and if somebody has a question about if they're a course that they've taken, does it meet and satisfy the um, requirements um, that we've outlined? Can people reach out to you with those sort of questions, Jess? Yeah, of course. On the CASPA website, they do have a list of course subjects, which will show which courses are available to be substituted for, for instance, the biology and chemistry uh, subjects. And I believe there's also a behavioral science section where it will show you all the courses that can be considered for behavioral science. And so that is a great reference. But if you ever have any questions, you can absolutely reach out to me and I'd be happy to look at your courses individually and let you know specifically about each course, what requirements they can fulfill. Excellent. And um, I'm glad you mentioned that course list because um, in the chat, I dropped the link for the course subjects in CASPA. So um, please feel free to grab that link and then you can sort of look at that, review that against what, you know, acceptable courses will fulfill those requirements or where you may have some gaps. And then you can reach out to us with any questions. And I think Jess, in that process, what's most helpful is if you send um, a course syllabus along with that request, right? Yes, a course syllabus or a link to the official course description on the school's website. Okay, excellent. So um, I know you shared during the presentation, but I think again, it's an important point to come back to. Is there a certain date prerequisite courses must be completed by for this current cycle? Yes, so the only prerequisites that have a time constraint are the anatomy and physiology requirements. They must mm -hmm. have been completed within seven years of your planned matriculation. So for this oh, okay. cycle, the planned matriculation would be May of 2024, which means that your anatomy and physiology courses must have been completed in 2017 or later. And um, that's very helpful to know, Jess. Let me clarify because um, there is also a, a deadline for any outstanding prerequisite coursework to be completed by for this cycle, meaning if somebody's got a planned course that they're taking this fall, when does that course need to be completed by in a transcript received or you know sent via CASPA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the course must have been completed by December 31st of 2023. Each year, mm -hmm. prerequisite courses must be completed by the end of the calendar year prior to matriculation. Okay, so that's good to know. And it's good to know about the sort of um, the age limit on that course. So you're saying anatomy and physiology is um, seven years. Yes, that's correct. Okay, awesome. So sometimes, you know, it's really helpful to just reiterate so that we reinforce this information because applying to, you know, a program, there's a lot of different components that come into this application. So we want to just make sure we're, we're, we're crystal clear with you. A um, mm -hmm. couple more questions regarding coursework, and we're happy to answer if there are any more. Um, please feel free to let us know. But um, what about students? We know that December 31st for the cycle, planned coursework needs to be completed. Um, we're coming up soon on our admissions deadline or application deadline, excuse me. What about those students who are have planned coursework? Can they submit their application? How should they acknowledge or indicate that on their application so that they can still move it through the process? What are your suggestions? Yeah, so CASPA does have an option to mark a course as in progress. And so okay. that's all you need to do with your missing prerequisite courses is make sure that you add them 
as in progress courses. And then we can keep that in mind and we can still review your application on the condition that the courses will be completed by December 31st. Okay, very helpful to know. Um, and last question um, that I at least have around coursework, uh, does UNE accept um, pass-fail coursework for any of its prerequisites? An exception has been made for coursework taken in the spring semester of 2020. Due to COVID, um, we can accept pass-fail prerequisites that were taken at that time. Um, other than that, we are not able to accept pass-fail courses for prerequisites. Okay, very good. And uh, um, along the same lines, uh, can you remind us how the GPA is calculated and if we allow for retakes, um, what does that process look like? Yeah, so all GPAs are calculated by CASPA and reported to us. Um, they do take into consideration all grades received. So if you've taken a course and then repeated it, it will average the two grades rather than replacing the older grade with the newer grade. So that is definitely something to keep in mind when performing your GPA calculations to make sure that you'll be meeting the minimums. Um, they do average all of the grades rather than replacing retaken grades. Okay. Um, and again, in that presentation, which um, when I send out this recording, I will also probably include a copy of the presentation just so that you can mm -hmm. review it. But it includes our minimum minimums for our overall GPA, as well as our BCP, which I think I got right, right, Jess? Yep. And what does that stand for again? That stands for biology, chemistry, and physics. And so only biology, chemistry, and physics courses are included in that GPA calculation. Okay. So um, we'll include alongside the uh, this recording will include our presentation so you can also go back and review some of that information if um, you're happening to log in um, during our conversation now and miss the sort of beginning of the presentation. Um, any other questions regarding coursework that we want to sort of dive into or, you know, at least share before we move on to talking about um, shadowing? My question's uh, for you, Jess. <laughs> yeah. Um, not off the top of my head. Um, okay. We do have the ability to evaluate your coursework on a case-by-case -case basis if necessary. Um, I really just want to reiterate that you should not have any hesitation about reaching out to me if you have any mm -hmm. questions. Um, I would just be happy to walk anyone through what they need to do. Excellent. I appreciate that. And I'm sure that's appreciated by those um, who are attending today's session. One last question um, that I, I think comes up often. We have a English uh, requirement or an English course requirement. Um, can you share a little bit about that? And if students have taken English courses, but they're not marked as reading or writing intensive, how does that work? And just shed a little bit of light around that specific requirement. Yeah, so um, English is actually also on the CASPA course subject website. Mm -hmm. So they do offer a few substitutions for English classes, including literature, composition, and poetry. Um, if you have a course that doesn't meet the CASPA uh, list of acceptable substitutions, but it was considered a writing intensive course at your institution, all you have to do is send me the link to that course description on the website so I can see that it's labeled as writing intensive um, and we can make an exception for that course. Um, oh, unfortunately, if the course is not officially labeled as a writing intensive course through the institution, we won't be able to substitute that for your English course. Okay, that's really good to know. So it's uh, important to look into um, and reviewing the course subjects um, on CASPA, but then again, reaching out if you have questions and um, providing some information, whether it be a, a course syllabus or a direct link to that information, I think would expedite um, some of this too. So mm -hmm. um, we're happy to come back to talking about coursework, but I think let's switch over and switch gears to maybe talking a bit about shadowing experience because we often get questions around that. Um, so um, we sometimes get ex um, questions around what are some examples of, well, we'll talk a little bit about shadowing and patient care experience 
Jess, can you share any specific examples of what would be acceptable or not accepted um, patient care experience? I know we have a document, so that's what I want to get to sharing too, but any thoughts around um, what the um, admissions committee is looking for? Yeah, so generally the idea is that patient care experience is going to be experience where you have direct hands-on interaction with patients. Um, it's experience where you are involved in creating and implementing a treatment plan mm -hmm. and or performing procedures yourself. And it doesn't have to be anything serious, but taking vitals, uh, drawing blood, helping with exams. These are all things that indicate hands-on patient care experience. And can you remind us of what the minimum requirements of how many hours must be completed at time of submission? At the time of your submission, you do have to have the minimum 500 hours of patient care experience completed. Um, you are welcome to continue updating your application after submission if you receive more hours. And we will see that as your application moves through the review process, but we cannot accept your application until you have met the minimums. Okay. And um, a question regarding um, somebody who's completing uh, an experience and at the time of submission, they have that minimum requirement, but they are continuing to complete hours. How would you recommend that they indicate that on their application? Should they leave the um, sort of the, the, the end date open? Um, what, are, what would you recommend to applicants? So yeah, you can leave the end date open. Um, you can leave it as an in-progress experience. Um, we do understand the limitations of the CASPA service. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you put in your experience and then you go back and get more hours, it's okay to just add it as a new entry um, with just the new hours that you've accumulated. Mm -hmm. um, and we understand that that means you've continued the position. Okay. And I think um, what's important is to not project out hours that you haven't completed, right? To leave things kind of open-ended. Yes. And that is why we leave it open for edits because um, we do not allow consideration of hours that will be completed. We can only review hours that have been completed at the time we are reviewing it. Okay. And does that, is that the same for shadowing hours, correct? Because this is direct patient care experience, what about shadowing? Yes, that is the same for shadowing hours. Um, you have to have the minimum 20 done by the time we receive your application and you can continue submitting after that, but we cannot uh, review projected shadowing hours. They must be completed. So um, I do wanna come back to talking a bit more about shadowing, but before we, we go into that, I wanna um, again share our admissions page. Um, I would love to share the direct file. Maybe I'll include that in the email with this recording, but within our admissions page, we do have a PDF document available to you to just open up to see some of the um, um, direct patient care, what we'll consider, what we won't consider for that um, experience. I was just looking over at my cork board because I have it right next to me. It's very helpful, it provides a, a long list of what would be considered and what wouldn't. So if you have questions about your experiences, this might be a good um, document for you to reference. Um, but um, in terms of shadowing and I guess PCE hours, is there any official documentation that's required to confirm that these hours have been completed or, or what does that look like for the applicant? Yeah, so we don't require any additional documentation. Um, okay. All that you do is log into your CASPA application, and when you go to put in those experiences, it will ask you where you completed them, who your overseer was, and what the dates were, and that's all the information that we require. Okay, excellent. So um, any other questions within this category that you um, often get, Jess, around direct patient care experience, shadowing? Um, yeah, um, I, I would like to reiterate that shadowing is um, unpaid volunteer observation. We cannot accept shadowing hours that were paid. We cannot accept shadowing hours that were part of a paid position, such as medical assistant or medical scribe. Um, and we do not accept work in close proximity with physician assistants as shadowing. 
um, it's very specific that it must be intentional observation shadowing that is unpaid. Um, does the admissions committee consider virtual shadowing at all? Yes, we do consider virtual shadowing. Okay. And um, I had another question around shadowing and patient care experience hours. I've lost it, so we might have to come back to that question. Mm -hmm. um, but again, just want to do a, a we're, we're, we hope that this conversation is helpful. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the q and I just want to take a quick look to make sure we haven't missed anyone. But um, why don't we shift to talking a little bit about um, some general questions. So um, is there a preference given to students from Maine or outside of um, New England? Um, and how does the admissions committee view students who are maybe um, from out of state? Yeah, so we have absolutely no consideration on where an applicant is from. We do mm -hmm. not have any regional or state quotas. Um, and so there is no extra consideration given to local or students who are coming from farther away. And if you attended one of our recent virtual events, our students shared, you know, that within their um, their cohort, they have students coming from across the country, certainly a good number of students coming from New England, but we really invite um, applicants um, from across the country to apply. And um, through these events, whether virtual or on campus, we really hope that you get a good sense of um, our mission, our values as a program and a community. And if that aligns with you, we'd be, um, and, and, and of course, as you continue through the process, um, we'd be welcoming to anyone um, from across the country. So um, I think it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so let's talk, can we talk a little bit about interviews? I know um, that's probably a question that um, people often are very curious about. Um, can you share the format of interviews and what that looks like for this current cycle? Yeah, so we'll be holding virtual interviews uh, through a program called Cura Talent. Mm -hmm. um, we, email, we will be emailing out interview invitations and you'll be invited to a virtual live interview on a scheduled date and time mm -hmm. where one applicant will be interviewing with two interviewers. Awesome. So um, this is a bit of a change from previous cycles where uh, we have um, historically interviewed in person. I think this is a great opportunity to um, provide a bit more access to those who are interviewing from all four corners of the country. And um, we are still happy to invite you to campus. That's why we have our campus tours with our students as well as our open houses so that you can still take a trip up to Maine, get a sense of our community and you know life in Portland, but you also don't have to do it alongside a bit of a stressful interview and, and, and that experience. So we're hoping that it's a positive one and um, excited to see how it goes, right, Jess? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, along the lines of interviews, in your opinion, Jess, and what you're um, comfortable with sharing, what makes someone a competitive applicant? Um, we have a very holistic review of applications and that does continue into our interview. It is very important that they get a sense of not only who you are as a person, but who you will be as a provider. Um, it's very important that you can demonstrate that you understand what a physician assistant is, what their role is, their scope of practice um, in comparison to other healthcare professionals. Um, we're really looking for a committed class of students with a diverse set of experiences. And so showing that you have had those experiences, that you are committed to being a physician assistant, that you understand what you're signing up for um, is really what will make you stand out. That's very helpful, Jess, and it actually triggered my memory around the question um, for shadowing and patient care experiences. So we know that just meeting minimums 
does not mean you're you'll be invited to interview or you know um, accepted into the program. You've shared that at a minimum we require 20 hours of shadowing experience and I think 500 hours of direct patient care experience. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of on average what our students are coming in with regarding experience and um, if you have some of the other information around GPA, that might be helpful, but um, I don't want, also want to put you on the spot if you're unable to answer some of those questions. Yeah, so our average accepted students have a GPA, both overall and BCP, of around 3.5. Um, our average accepted students have upwards of 2,000 direct patient care hours and mm -hmm. 80 to 100 shadowing hours. So remember, that's an average. We may have students who are coming under that or more than that, but that will give you a sense of um, a ballpark where you may be landing with that. But as Jess shared, it's a holistic review process. So we are obviously looking for minimum requirements, but students have been preparing you know, beyond and completing beyond those minimum requirements as well. So there's a bit of a balance there, but I think that's really helpful just to understand on average what our students are coming in with. Um, so let me just take a sec to review our list of questions. Um, just any areas that we haven't touched upon that you get questions about and you would want to discuss in this forum? Um. Yeah, um, we can circle back to the letters of recommendation really quickly. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that we. That. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we emphasize that at least one letter must be from a practicing clinician, being an MD, a DO, a PA, or an NP. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important that you have one of those letters. We will not review your application without a letter from a clinician, um, and I want to reiterate that CASPA does have a maximum of five letters of recommendation. So please be careful that you're making sure you get your clinician letter before asking for extra letters because you don't want to get all five letters and then realize oh. that you don't have a clinician letter. Mm -hmm. And that spot is filled by a letter that may, that wasn't a requirement. Exactly. Basically. No, that's very helpful. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up around letters, but I think um, the three required, one being from a clinician is the most important. And as you've mm -hmm. shared, it really should speak to the applicant's ability to perform um, professionally, academically, in a clinical setting. So um, in the presentation, Jess had shared some helpful areas that you might want your letter writers to highlight. Um, we always talk or we always recommend to applicants, you know, to pick someone who knows you well and who has worked with you. And as you're asking them to, um, you know, um, provide you a letter, maybe talk about the program and some of these aspects. You know, we're looking for students who um, are, have worked in groups, collaborate, whatever it m might be on. If there's an experience that you've had that that letter writer can highlight, it might be a nice conversation to set them up for, you know, um, set them up to write this letter. Of course, you can't write it for them, <laughs> so you won't know what it comes out, uh, what the end product might look like, but I think it's a helpful conversation to have with your letter writer. Um, so let's just... We may wrap up a few minutes early if there are any other questions. Um, I want to just check my list one more time and um, see if there's any other areas that we want to quickly touch upon. But I think this has been helpful. Um, I, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we're not trying to um, stress you out, but you may want to consider completing your application soon, right, Jess? Yes. Um, you still have some time to submit your application, but again, October 2nd is that verified application deadline. And if you're submitting your application on that point, we know CASPA won't get it verified within a day. So it might just be, um, you just want to consider that against your own timeline. Um, 
But I think, Jess, we've answered a lot of the common questions. We dived into some specific areas. You shared a little bit about our review process and what makes competitive applicants. So we hope that insight is helpful. Um, we are happy to stick on and answer any other questions, but also don't want to take up any more time if you want to use this to have your lunch or go back to work or do whatever you're doing today. Um, anything else, Jess, that you'd like to share? Uh, I don't think so. I'll just put out there one more time that you can absolutely contact me for any questions that you have. Um, mm -hmm. It's always going to be better to reach out to me for clarification than to take guesses and chances with your application. Yeah, definitely. Because once you submit that, we're some, we're reviewing whatever you've submitted. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if you've missed an area um, or um, didn't include something, uh, it may not, it may not be included in the review process. Um, so we, I think we'll end the session a little bit early. Hope you're enjoying your afternoon and um, we'll follow up with this event recording so that you can review the um, session if you had any, you know, notes that you wanted to take, but I will share the presentation along with some other helpful documents that direct patient care experience list. So you'll get a sense of that as well. And we look forward to reviewing your application when it's uh, received. So very nice. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Jess. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your help with this. And we'll see mm -hmm. you soon.